today we're going to do a little bit of a working Wednesday walkabout but I also want to show you that I've had some preliminary work done that I did not do and I think I shared that with you before which is a good strategy if if you can afford it and I recognize everyone can't but if you can afford it and especially if, if it's things that require more muscle power or a stronger back then get someone else to do that and you do the things that require a little bit more finesse and a little bit more of a design eye so for example my friend Victor that helps me around here I went and I bought a bunch of mulch and he came in and he helped me spread it and that was very helpful for me because it was a lot of carrying and lifting lots of heavy bags. And I did use the Happy Grow Landscapers mix from Lowe's. Apparently some Lowe's have it and some don't, but you can find another really good mulch that you like. And then I try to just be as consistent with my mulch coverage around as, as I can. Now you will notice a lot more negative space in my front garden than I had before. And that's because I've cut back a whole bunch of things and in the void, I remulched. And actually I like the way it looks. I like and, this. and here is a tip, Stuart, mm -hmm. uh, and a tip for you guys. If you wanna know if the cadence and the spacing of your evergreens and your fixture plants, what I call furniture plants, are in the right locations, or if you have a void that needs to be filled, then look from above. So that is my bedroom window and my office window up above. And I look from both of those windows, I look down to see if I really like, and when I say cadence, I mean the rhythm and the spacing and the movement of primarily the boxwood balls. Now, what you're gonna see at this point in time, while everything else doesn't look too, too bad, and we got a little bit of rain, last week but not nearly enough um, but what you'll notice is while all of the evergreens look pretty good and i've managed to keep them watered with the exception of some of the ewes which have some browning needles on them but they are still alive and i think they'll they'll still recover and i'll tidy those up a little bit linda this is my new second favorite thing. I don't know if it's new or not, I guess. This is now my second favorite, favorite thing. thing in the well, garden. I talk about that now I have more negative space and more clearing. And one of the things that that did was reveal features that have been there for a very long time. I, I, I didn't that, even know it was there. that large boulder because it's usually obscured by all of the things growing around it. But it also is, is nice because when I do cut things back, it doesn't make this area look so bare or, or scream, okay, Linda, just cut all those things back. It looks as if there's something there and it's very, very intentional. But I do have one area of the front yard that right now just clearly looks hideous. And that's my question of the day. Do you have any area in your front yard or in your backyard that just really took it on the chin this summer and just looks really hideous and you haven't been sure what to do about it. Well, for me, it's this area front and center right here where I have all of the tulips in the spring. And before it looked hideous, it didn't look so bad because it was filled with lots of this creeping phlox, which was still green, and lots of vinca minor, which I know in some of your gardens, is invasive but not but not in mine but it had it had started consuming this area and it looked beautiful until the temperatures started to regularly hit the century mark for days on end and so because of that what i did when i had victor come out because it was difficult for me to do maybe i should have had him do this too no i think i got it um, is i had him take a weed eater and I knew it would brutalize this, but nevertheless, sometimes before the pretty, you have to make ugly. And so <laughs> you have to suffer for beauty. So I had him come in and weed eat all of it down. And in fact, it just got so overgrown that it strangled this tiny, little, I think maybe it was a soft touch holly that I had in here. And so rather than try to revive it, I am just getting rid of it. 
So, I can see here about how much, how much is left. So then you ask, so what am I going to do now? Well, he did the preliminary cutting back with, with the weed eater. And now what I'm going to do is more of the fine tuning cut back. And this is one of those kinds of things I talk a lot about. I seldom have a large period of time or much less a whole day where I can come out and work in the garden. But this is one of those things that I can do in the margins of my time when I have, say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if I'm talking to somebody on the phone, if I'm talking to Stuart, Stuart and I have been doing lots of very productive brainstorming on the phone. And because of that, when we started to shoot this video, we both had popcorn brain and it was kind of difficult for us to get, to get back to where we needed to be. So for example, this phlox, I'm gonna come in here and just clean out any dead stuff. When I started cutting back this section right here, lo and behold, what it did was expose my stepping stones. So Stuart, come in close if you would. So this is some of that gorgeous lavender creeping thrift or creeping phlox. It's called emerald blue. And I am just gonna cut it back. And let me tell you, it will be happy that I am because I haven't done this for years. So I'm cutting it back pretty hard. So see here, it has a good strong root system. It will come out from that root system, but now it's kind of all dead in here and the, the green is just at the end. But if you look carefully, Stuart with your camera, can you show, see the green? coming out right there. Yep. So this is definitely still very, very viable. I don't know at this point if I could kill it, even if I wanted to. So I'm just gonna go through here and I'm gonna give it a hard clip back. And if I get any of that vinca minor along with it, that's okay too, because it needs to be clipped back. And then I'll just remove any kind of browning things that are in here. If I see nuts mm. or leaves or any kind of trash that's growing up in here. Stuart, did a mosquito get you? It landed on me. We'll see if it got a bite or not. Oh, hopefully not. We haven't had, because it's, it's been so dry, been we bad. have not had a bad Sorry mosquito to always here come back to this, guys, this yeah, year. It's not bad. And so see, I can take just a few minutes and I can talk to you while I'm doing this. And speaking of talking, I don't think we've ever had so much fun in a Linda Vodder Live when we did our live was... YouTube, YouTube uh, segment this past Sunday. I don't know if we were just a little bit extra zany or loony or what. And plus, the more we do them, the more we figure out features on doing them. Yeah. So we can more it efficiently helps. answer your questions. Okay, so I'm doing this area. And I can be, as you can be, more or less aggressive in cutting it back because as I said, the root system has been here for years and is very, very viable. Is there anything special? I didn't get a close. Is there anything special about how or where you're cutting? Okay, it? not necessarily. I'm just cutting back the long line. So let's, let's use this as an example. And this is true of pretty much any ground cover. So see, I've got this long kind of dead branch right there. Yeah. And then look right there. There's a little tuft. Show see that? Again. Okay. See that tuft of green right there? Yes. Okay. I can cut all the way back to that tuft of green come. because that's going to come back because the root system is still viable, which is why I have the luxury of cutting back all of these dead tendrils. 
And yes, you think, oh my gosh, do I really want to get out there with a pair of scissors and be that exacting? Well, you may not, and that is perfectly fine. You could just weed eat it back, or quite frankly, you could just leave it brown and ultimately the dead parts would fall away and new growth would be pushed out next spring. But this, again, if this was in an area that was not so prominent in my garden, then I might not do this. But it is not a hot morning. I am in some shade. I can talk to you while I'm doing it, or talk to my sister, or talk to a neighbor that stops by, and I can still get a lot done. And I'm sitting down, so it's, it's really, not that difficult. So I get one area, I have immediate gratification. Clean up these leaves. And then I can just say, okay, next time I come out here, or right now, and these are just those cheap dollar store scissors. I find that they work better even than pruners for this type of activity. And what I discovered when they weed, when they weed eated it back, weed eated, <laughs> weed whacked it back for the first time, I discovered there were stepping stones on here that had been so covered up over the years that I forgot they were even there. It's like a garden beneath the garden. It, it is. It's just like garden archaeology where I am discovering past <laughs> historic <laughs> treasures. I guess it's kind of like finding different color paints under the paint. Yes, yes, yes. Or sometimes <laughs> um, in these old houses, sometimes when you, I don't know, when you make a change, when you remove wallpaper, you do something, you will find remnants of a past era. So when I've done some stuff in my house, Stuart, I've exposed phone numbers written on the wall oh, where the wow. phone used to hang when there was just like when there were just like five digits to the yeah, phone number. Yeah, that's crazy. Or where there was a name or a word before like, you know, something something 520. Okay, so I'm just cutting this back and I think I've given you guys an idea of what I'm doing. But look how much tidier this is. And then when I completely am finished, I will take my handy dandy blower, blow off the debris, and before you know it, this whole area will look very, very groomed. Good garden grooming. Then I can come back in and I will put another, just one bag of mulch over this to hide some of the cuts. That will help it grow back. And even before next spring, this will start putting out, especially if we get some rain, this will start putting out some new growth, especially if I give it some kind of organic uh, granular fertilizer. So I can come out here with my cup of coffee, with my glass of wine in the evening when it's cool. I've got my, my trusty scissors. And it is, it is so cathartic. It is just so cathartic. Okay, so I spent way too much time doing this, but I appreciate the heck out of you guys <laughs> keeping me company while I did this. So tell me what your plans are for any area in your garden that looks um, maybe especially, especially hideous. Stuart, can you see the change that I that I've made? Yeah, I got a wide shot for him to kind of okay, see the, the good. area you haven't okay. touched versus the one. So you then, have. this will look so much better. So you can kind of see how much better this section looks than the section that I haven't done. And by, and I just know that by doing this, I am not only going to remove the dead, but I'm. I'm going to force it to thicken up. So then this area, when I get ready to pumpkinize or autumnalize, however I choose to do that for introducing my fall decor, I've been talking a lot about my outdoor fall decor and my fall prep uh, recently, then I will have a beautiful, less brown, well-groomed 
tableau upon which I can paint my seasonal portraits. And I think it will be, it will be really fun. Now, some things I've done in the past, um, this was so fun. And this is how, I talked about this, I think, in my book, how your garden transitions over time. And here's another question I might have for you. If you or me and you're going to pumpkinize or, or autumnalize, what kind of would you do in this space? Now for me, because I have so many weddings this fall, uh, that may inform my selections. But if you were me, what would you do and where would you place some of your fall decor items? But as I started to say earlier, in the past, I've had a trio. This year was this, I'm so sad I did not get more pictures of it. One year when my boys were small, I had three scarecrows here. I had a mama scarecrow and I had two little boy scarecrows. <laughs> And I really decorated them up to the nines. I had snakes coming out of their pockets and I had all sorts of fun things. And I, at, at this point I think, oh, well, that was kind of mean of me not to have a dad, a dad scarecrow, yeah. but I, I, I think I just didn't have another tall one. <laughs> I didn't one. even notice you were missing Yeah, I that. didn't have another tall one at the time. <laughs> so it was, it was very fun. And then we had jack-o'-lanterns and all sorts of fun and later spooky things. But my, but my first thing is not Halloween. I don't go straight to Halloween. First I do pumpkinizing and autumnalizing. And typically I start that around the first part of September. If you are, here's a tip, if you are in my zone and you have fescue or you have Bermuda grass that's overseeded with rye, around September 15th is the time when you're gonna to wanna to scalp your yard and overseed it either with a perennial rye or fescue or whatever it is that you use. Just make sure that the temperatures have started to moderate and if you can, do it before a gentle rain. And here's my shout out to everybody in Texas and in the Dallas area in the Southwest, like in so many parts of the country now, it's drought, 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 and then it's deluge. And parts of Dallas got as much as 11 inches of rain wow. in 24 hours, a whole summer's worth plus of rain in 24 hours. And I know it's caused all sorts of damage. So if you're in Texas and experiencing some of that, you, um, you definitely have, have my sympathies and my concern. So Stuart, what, what else do I need to point out on my Wednesday walkabout? Here's something I don't think I have showed. Shown, Ooh, I have I shown. I you on that one, I stopped myself. <laughs> and this beautiful Laura Petalum, this is, this is not one of the Southern Living Laura Petalums. This is one I planted a million years ago. And, and this is the advantage of getting something established because there have been several, several occasions when in the winter it's died back completely, but then it comes back and it puts out this beautiful, at this time of year, kind of multiple colored branching with cascading limbs of this lovely purple and green, which look Stuart. It's always been one of my favorites. Harmonizes too. perfectly with this obsession Nandina. So look here, this is just, you talk about the perfect color echo and a little bit of a textural uh, contrast. And then both of these branches, both from the Obsession Andina and this, would look, would look beautiful in cut flower arrangements. And then someone asked me during the live, what was my favorite pollinator plant for fall, pollinator perennial for fall? And I would have to say probably the various forms of sedums that bloom. This is Sedum Autumn Joy. Um, and I also love just Sedum Joy, but it comes out with the prettiest dusty pink blooms. Got to get a weed here, Stuart, while I'm in the area. Um, the most beautiful dusty pink blooms that pollinators just love. And I don't know whether I like the blooms better or I like them better when they're in bud form. And a lot of times I will cut those and bring those in for flower arrangements just when it's in when it's in bud form. So while things up close look a little scruffy, they are still holding their own um, from a distance. And I think that we feel so much more optimistic, uh, so much more 
like the tide has turned because temperatures aren't nearly so brutal. And now we just need a good rain, not just a, not just a spit of a rain like we, we've been having that does nothing yeah. but get your car dirty. Yeah. We need a really, really good rain. So I'm going to take off my gloves now. And a lot of you, by the way, I mentioned, I can't remember what I mentioned, that these, these cool job gloves that I love so much, these were on special and they are on big sale. You can get a multi-pack of them. I love these. My tip about these, however, is that while they easily wash, don't put them in the dryer because this stuff can kind of melt in the dryer. So I just throw them in the wash with rags and things and then they dry in no time at all. But I, they're just very comfortable. I really like them. And like I say, I think they're on sale now. So buy yourself a present. Stuart, let's try to remember to put a link. Okay. Um, put a link on there. So th there you go. I think things aren't looking too bad, though I've still got some puffing to do before I, I leave. And, and some of you have expressed concern that people will know that I'm going to be leaving and going to Singapore. Well, well, Stuart said for me, he's always looking out for me, and he said, make sure that we let everyone know that I've got I've got all sorts of people who will be here watering my plants, staying in my house, taking care of some things while I'm gone. And that's the nice thing about having good friends and family because they can they come and they watch things for you yep. while while you're away. Isn't that right, Stuart? Indeed. So I feel like things are, are in in good hands. So there you go. There is my, my Wednesday walkabout. You can see that the drift roses over here are starting to spit out. It's just funny, like we've almost ended three times. Yeah, I know, and, and I'm so sorry. Like, I'm, I'm so not worried sorry. about it, it's good. But I actually saw funny. something in bloom, and the, those are the drift roses. So now before Stuart makes any more fun of me, <laughs> I will end on that note as I pull out one more weed. And you guys go out and do your own Wednesday walkabout. Well, here you go. If you've held on this long, here is my OOTD, as fashion influencers call it, my outfit of the day. My sunglasses are Ray-Ban, black sunnies, just classic, and I love them. My earrings are also classic. They're just some of my beloved hoop earrings. I believe I got these from a little store called Eden, a boutique in the Paseo District. My top is made well, and actually I got this just two years ago. I was looking back, Stuart, do you remember I when we did a collaboration? Computer, we did a collaboration yeah. with Madewell in their store, and, and I got this during that collaboration. My britches are high-rise ankle-length skinny jeans, even though skinny jeans are technically, I, I think, maybe not as popular right now, but I still love them, and I got these online. And my shoes, my sandals came from Forever 21, a million years ago, I love them. And as always, my trusty Apple Watch. So there you go. There is my outfit of the day.